good this morning? Do you believe that God still has miracle performing power? Amen. I think he does. Amen. And I'm so glad that God has chosen us to save our souls, to send Jesus for us. He is so good and we don't deserve it. But let's not forget that that miracle performing power is the same God that controls every aspect of our lives. That he's the one that makes us wait. That he's the one that says no to us. And it hurts sometimes. But God is always good. And God is always good whether we understand it or not. Amen. So let's sing this next song and, and remember that, that he's in control of more than just our day-to-day. -day. You know, he's got, he's got an end plan for us. He's got his sovereignty is good and he knows it to the end. Let's worship this morning. up in my hands will be like the Indian sacrifice. God of creation, there at the start, for the beginning of time, No point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, and as you speak. can see your heart and everything you made. Every burning star is promise you don't speak in vain no syllable into your own voice but once you have 
I can see your heart and everything you say. Every pain is got a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you, so will I. So will down my heart through all of my failure and pride I heal you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and as you speak and as you speak disappear when you lost your life so I could find it here if you left the grave behind you so alive I can see your heart and everything you've done every part designed and worked Call love. If you gladly chose surrender, so will I. I can see your heart a billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life. Like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? Miss this last part. You're the one who never believes the one behind. Amen. Like you would again. Hundred billion times, but what 
measure could amount to your desire. You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Amen.
Father, let that be our cry this morning, that the things that we seem to dedicate so much of our time to, God, will be inconsequential, but only Christ, only Christ is what our life's calling is for, only for the good news of salvation and forgiveness of sin. God, give us a true perspective of what the gospel is and how it's still a miracle that it happened at all. Give us Jesus. Give us more of him. Let us see more of him around us. Let us experience him more. But God, let us seek him more too. We love you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can sit. All right, all right. Hey, listen, if you are here uh, for the very first time, thanks for coming today. Uh, if you are brand new, uh, I just want to welcome you. My name is Mark. I'm the lead pastor. We're excited to have you uh, here with us today. Uh, if you've been coming for a little bit and I've never met you, I'd love to meet you right after church out there in the lobby at our welcome area. Uh, just say hi to you, shake your hand and all that. We've got a free gift for everybody that's brand new this morning. And uh, that's at the welcome area. Fill out your connection card. It's a card around you. Here's what it looks like. I'll show you one right there. Just for full effect, there's the connection card. It's on the back of the seat in front of you. And uh, fill that out. Take it to the welcome area um, after church. If you're a first-time guest, we've got a gift for you. Uh, before we get started, um, before we get started, I, I want to mention a couple of things to our church here um, that are coming up that you need to know about. The first one is February the 7th is Night to Shine. If you don't know what Night to Shine is, um, it's an event from the Tim Tebow Foundation. Journey Church puts it on, um, at, but a lot of churches in the area uh, come alongside and help, and we, we have been a part of this. Uh, this will be the third time they've done it, and so we've been a part of this uh, every year, and they need help. I was talking to some, uh, a few people there this week, uh, and they need people to help. If you've never been a part of Night to Shine, oh my goodness, you need to be a part of Night to Shine. It's one of the funnest best events ever. It's so amazing, uh, this event is. Um, and, and yeah, you get to bless people and serve people, uh, but man, it's, it's a blessing for you. And, but here's the deal. You actually have to fill out a volunteer form to do it. We have those at our welcome area. If you want to help with Night to Shine, uh, you can fill that out. Uh, now listen to what I'm about to say here, all right? They need these forms. This is not like some kind of thing that hoop that you don't have to jump through. They need these forms legally for, for, to do, for everybody to, who wants to help with this event. So if you want to volunteer for, the ten, uh, for, to, for Night to Shine, out there at the welcome area are the volunteer forms. You can, you can fill it out and leave it at the welcome area, but if you think that takes too long, you can take it, fill it out, and I'll tell you what you can do. You can take a picture of it and send it to me on Facebook, and I will get it to the appropriate people. They have got to have it. They either need a hard copy or a digital copy, which is you fill it out, take a picture, we get it to them. Uh, but, but you've got to fill that out. Those are out there today. They need those ASAP. All right. So Night to Shine coming up February the 7th. One thing that I want to mention to you also that weekend, February the 9th, we're having a, a Super Bowl watch party. It's right here, so bring some of your favorite Super Bowl finger foods. Come watch the Super Bowl here, 630. But something I want to mention I'm really excited about, February the 9th, uh, February, well, February the 9th, yeah, February 2nd, Super Bowl party. I got my dates mixed up. February the 9th is when we're starting small groups. 
Now, this is a brand new small group experience, and everything in small groups is happening on one night, on Sunday nights, all right? They are beginning February the 9th at 6 o'clock. You can sign up right now for a small group on our app. You can go to the Welcome Area After Church. They'll get you connected. If you actually go to the app right now, there are three groups for you to sign up for. There's a men's group, a women's group, and a married couples group. But we are actually going to add a fourth group, and that's just a mixed group group. So, you know, men and women together, you're not married, that sort of thing. Uh, but, but so we're going to have four groups and they all meet on the same night right here, six o'clock. Okay. This is going to be something that, man, I'm praying that everybody in the church jumps in on this. Uh, we're going to have child care for, it's going to be a really big deal. All right. So February 9th, small groups, mention that, sign up right now on the app. You got questions, ask me about it out there in the lobby. Okay, now uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray and uh, ask God to uh, just just to bless our time and speak to us. And so would you, if you would just bow your heads and, and let's just go to go to God in prayer today. Father, I pray that you would help us just to really lean in today and hear from you. Uh, God, you're who we want to hear from. We're, we, we don't really nobody is really keen on hearing from from a person, let alone me. Uh, God, nobody needs to hear what I have to say. We all desperately need to hear what you have to say. And so, God, would you speak? Uh, God, would you just give me the words to say? Would you open up our eyes and our hearts, God, to who you are? You are right here with us. And so, God, just make us aware of your presence. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Now, now here's the deal. Uh, if you are uh, if you are new, you're visiting with us today. Uh, man, I'm so I'm fired up that you're here. Uh, but here's the deal, and I kind of mentioned this at the end of last week. But here's what we're doing today. Uh, uh, if you're visiting, you're new. Thank thankful that you're here. Uh, this is a family talk today. All right. So if you're a partner of some of your church, uh, that we're having a church talk today. This is a family talk. What we're doing. So maybe you've been coming for a little bit and you're thinking, listen, you know, we've been coming to this church for a little bit, maybe a couple of weeks, couple of months. Uh, I, I would love to know what makes this church tick. I'd love to know what they're thinking. I'd love to know maybe more about where they're going. Uh, well, you're going to get some of that today. This is a family talk here today, uh, but I think that everybody hopefully will get uh, something out of it. God will speak to you. So what we're doing today, we are wrapping up our series Focus. Now, it's just been a three-week series. It's been a really powerful time. If you've missed any of Focus, you can go back on our app. You can go on the website and watch it and that sort of thing. Uh, but what we've done in this series is we've just tried to ask the question, who are we becoming? You know, what kind of people are we becoming? We said the first week that God wants us to become people of love. Last week we asked the question, we kind of went behind the scenes of the who are you becoming question, and we asked the question last week, what kind of things are shaping you? So the people that we're becoming, there are things, we're, we're being shaped by someone, something. So we kind of dug deep uh, in that last week. Here's what I want to do today. Today, the question that I want to ask is, who are we as a church becoming? Who are we becoming as a church, as Summit Community Church? So I'm not talking like Big C Church, Church of Jesus all over the world. Who are we, Summit Community Church, who are we becoming? Now, if you've been coming for a little bit, you might remember that back in November, the first two Sundays of November, uh, I preached two sermons, and we talked about uh, for, on those two Sundays. You can go back and listen to it right now on our app. You can go back and watch it on our website. You can find these easily. Uh, but the first two Sundays of November, what we, what we said during those two Sundays is we believe, uh, just feel very strongly, that God is calling our church to pray for genuine, real revival and renewal that would transform Eastern Kentucky, transform our church, transform every single church, just literally change the trajectory of where our community is going. Just a, a move of God that would impact every layer of society. So education, uh, economy, everything would be impacted on, on a spiritual level, but on every single level. I mean, we're praying for a move of God that literally looks like the kingdom coming down out of heaven and making its way into hazard. That's what we're praying for as a church. Say, Mark, we haven't talked about that a lot. Maybe you've sprinkled it into some sermons, but we haven't talked about it a lot. That's been intentional. Uh, it's been intentional that we did that. Uh, and, and, but, but, but even though maybe we haven't given a lot of sermons to it, 
past couple of weeks, you need to know that that, that desire, that passion, that hunger, it hadn't kind of lessened, it hadn't went to the background. If anything, it's become stronger. I am more convinced than ever that what Eastern Kentucky needs is the presence and power of God to move, not just on Sunday mornings in an hour, but to move and change every single thing, to change the direction of schools, to impact the next generation, to repair broken families, to set people free from addiction. We're just praying for a genuine move of the Holy Spirit in our time. And so when we ask the question, who are we becoming as a church? The answer to the question is this, we are becoming a people of prayer. That God wants our church to become a people of prayer. Now, now I need you to watch this. The wording there is very intentional. Not a people who pray, but a people of prayer. You say, what's the difference? Well, the difference is this. People of prayer, it could be that prayer is just one thing that we do among other things. So our church does outreach, we, we feed the hungry, uh, we give people clothing, we try to meet needs, we do things for kids and students, and also we pray. That is not what I'm talking about. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when I say that God wants our church to become a people of prayer, that prayer somehow literally becomes a part of our DNA as a church. That we learn, and this is something, honestly, you have to learn. It doesn't come intuitively. You have to grow into this. You have to learn it because on accident, you don't pick this up. That we would learn as a church how to listen to God. That we would learn as a church how to wait on God. That we would learn as a church how to follow God. Watch this. That we would learn as a church how to follow God and not create a plan and ask God to bless our plans. Did you catch that? Hello? Right? That, that we would learn how to follow God and say, God, what do you want? Where are you working? Because we want to join in with you. That God wants us to become a people of prayer. Jesus said, my house will be a house of prayer. And we want to be that house. Amen? We, we want to be the kind of people that are learning, listening to God. We, we, we want to become a church that is a people. We are a people of prayer. And, and so what we're going to do is we are going to put a lot of energy into this. Honestly, this sermon is just to, kick, uh, to, just to try to kick off and get us ready for the, ne for the next series that we're going to start. The next series that we're going to start, the logo was on the screen a minute ago, is called Pray Eastern Kentucky. So Pray E-K-Y is the name. There's the logo of our next series. It is a 10-week series on prayer. We have never done a 10-week series before. We are given 10 weeks to prayer. Uh, we're going to talk about all kinds of different things, and not only are we going to do it on Sunday morning, those small groups that I mentioned, at least for seven or eight weeks, the first part of that uh, of, of our small groups, that, that semester is going to be 13 weeks long, take you about a week or two after Easter. The first seven or eight weeks of small groups, every Sunday night, not just learning how to pray, but giving us practical tools on how to do it on our own. So it's not something you do, you do, you wait to do it at church with somebody like me guiding you. You learn how to become a person of prayer. Because listen, church isn't a building that you go to, it's what? It's people. It's you and me. Listen, if we're going to become a people of prayer, a church of prayer, that means we have to pray. We're, we're going to become a people of prayer. So we're going to give a lot of energy to learning how to pray. But here's the deal, man. People have a hard time with prayer don't they? People have a hard time figuring out how to pray. I talk to people all the time, Mark, I don't know what to say when I pray. I feel like when I pray, I fall asleep a lot. I feel like I mumble a lot. I feel like I don't really know what I'm supposed to do in prayer. Some of you are thinking this, listen, this sounds great, but Mark, if I'm honest, I've been praying for the same thing for years, and I don't even know if God's listening to me. I mean, what do you do when you pray and ask God to do something and it doesn't seem bad on paper, seems lined up with God's will on paper, and He's just not doing it? 
We're honestly going to talk about all of those things, all right? We're going to talk about all of those things in Pray EKY over the next, uh, over the next year. We're going to give a lot of focus to this as a church. But here's what I want us to see before we even move into this series, before we move on. We're going to close out this focus series uh, this way. Here's what I want us to see. If we're really going to become people of prayer, then we have to have the right view of God. And so many Christians, so many people that come to church just don't. Maybe you picked it up from like a bad church experience. Maybe you had some bad teaching at one time in your life. But so many people who, who are genuinely Christians, they're really saved, but they just have an off view, a negative view, just the wrong view of God. A lot of people who come to church, and maybe this is you, a lot of people who come to church, they have a view of God where God is the distant deity. So God's real, but he's out there, and he doesn't really intervene in your life. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of this. Have you guys ever heard of, um, it, this is a real thing, have you ever, guys ever heard of the belief system called deism? You ever heard of that? You know what deism is? You ever heard of it? Deism is simply this. Listen to this. Watch this. Deism is the belief that there is a God, and that God created everything that is, even you and me. And after God created everything, he stepped back, and now he's watching what he made, but he never gets his hands in it. He never intervenes in it. You know, remember, remember maybe when you were little, or I don't know, maybe you still play with tops. Remember spinning a top, and you'd spin it, then you step back and watch? That's what deism is. God created everything. He's put it into motion, and now God is off in the distance watching everything, right? And a lot of Christians are functional deists. Let me say that again. A lot of Christians are functional deists. So we read the Bible and we know some scripture, but we read the Bible to make us feel good. We, we, we pick up some principles from this book, but the principles are separated from the person that wrote it. We come to church and we sing songs, but there's just this haunting belief. There's just this fear inside of us, man. Listen, we believe in God. God made us and we love him, but listen, he's out there. He doesn't intervene in my life. God doesn't really seem to break through into my life. I believe in God. I even think that God loves me, but I think that he's somewhere out there. And listen, if you believe that God is out there but not getting his hands dirty in and through your life, you will not become a person of prayer. Another way that people uh, tend to view God is they tend to view God as a boss. And not just any kind of boss. I'm talking about the kind of boss that you can't please. You ever had a boss like that? Right? I mean, no matter how hard you work, no matter how good your performance is, it just never seems to match up to their standards. You're not even sure if this boss likes you. You know what I mean? And listen, listen, when you have that kind of relationship with your boss, I mean, it might be a formal relationship. You pass each other in the hallway, but again, you don't even know if they like you. You say hi to them. You're never going to have a close relationship with a boss like that, are you? I mean, you're walking on eggshells around them. You're not even convinced that they, that, that they like you. You're never going to have a relationship with a boss like that. That's how a lot of people think about God. God is this boss, and they're just trying to please, but there's just this sense inside of them. God's just disappointed. Or maybe, and right in line with this, is that God is also an angry, diso uh, disappointed father. It's the same thing. My earthly, but on this one, my earthly father was disappointed with me. Why should my heavenly father be any different? In both of those, just this nagging sense. I don't know if they like me. I don't know if God likes me. I, I, yeah, God loves me, but I don't know if he likes me. And you will never become a person of prayer if that's where you are. You'll have a formal relationship with God. You'll say hi to him. You'll sing songs about him. Again, you'll read and you'll find some comfort in this book. This book, though, won't take you to the person that wrote it. Because a part of you thinks that person doesn't like you. Another way that people look at God is that God's their assistant. God is our, God's my assistant. Here's how you know that God, here's how you know you treat God as your assistant. The only time you pray, the only time you talk to him is when things are going bad. Hello, right? That's the only time. God's my assistant. So when do I talk to him? When things are going bad. This view of God actually has a bumper sticker. You ever seen that bumper sticker? God is my co-pilot. You ever seen that? Right? 
By the way, we have volunteers who are scoping the parking lot right now. If that's on your vehicle, we are scraping it off as we speak. Horrible theology. All right? You're, you're welcome. You don't even have to uh, tip, tip, uh, tip us or anything like that. We're just scraping that off your bumper right now. What does that say, though? I'm joking. What does that say, though? It says this. I'm the pilot, and if I need help, i got to get co-pilot. See, when God's your assistant, the only time you pray and you talk to him is when things go bad. So people do this. Oh, man, things are not going right. Things are falling apart in my life. I got to go to church. I got to start reading my Bible more. I got to start praying. Somehow I got to get some Jesus dust sprinkled on me so that things start going better. Listen, when God is your assistant, here's how prayer works. When God is your assistant, here's how prayer works. Prayer is like the fire alarms we have on the walls. It's good that we've had them. We've got them. We've never used them. That's how prayer is. It's good to know it's there. I don't use it much. This one, though, is really popular. It's that God is a genie. God is my own personal genie. And what's he supposed to do? Whatever I want. I don't get three wishes. I get infinite wishes, y'all. I have a connection with the God of the universe, and he gives me what I want. Right? So, so when God's our genie, that's his job. God's job is just to give us what we want. And we expect a certain kind of life. We expect certain kind of friends, a certain kind of spouse, car, income, kids. We expect things from God. And so when God is our genie, here's what prayer sounds like. Gimme, 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 gimme. That's all prayer sounds like, right? It's just one long wish list. It's as if God is Santa Claus on steroids here. Do you know what I mean, right? He's got it all. Let's ask him for it. Here's the catch. When God isn't giving you the life that you expect God to give you, a lot of people who are here walk away. Because I got saved to get a certain thing from Jesus, and he's not very good at giving me what I want. So I'm out. Now, now, stop for a second. Do any of these sound like your relationship with Jesus? Now, if we're honest this morning, even me, a lot of us, we can fall, maybe depending on the season we're in, we can fall in and out of a couple of these, right? I'm talking consistently, just a regular pattern. Oh, my relationship with God sounds like a genie. My relationship with God sounds like the distant deity. Do you see yourself on here? You will never become, we will never become people of prayer with these. Here's why. Because prayer flows out of relationship. Prayer flows out of relationship. So if this is not the way that we should see Jesus, how should we see him? How does Jesus want us to see him? So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and open it up, John 15. John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17 is where we are. John 15, 12 through 17. I love these verses. They're on the screen, but again, go ahead and open up your own Bible if you've got one. They're in the app. They've got a Bible around you somewhere. John 15, 12 through through 17. I love these verses from Jesus. Watch this, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from the Father, I've made known to you. Think about that. For all that I've made known to the Father, all that the Father's made known to me, I've made known to you. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I've commanded you so that you will love one another. A few things I want you to notice out of here before we dig into this. Notice, remember first week of uh, of focus? First week of focus, who are we becoming? God wants us to become what? Anybody remember? People of, starts with an L, L ends with, uh, hey, look at y'all, love. I was about to throw out a pretty good hint there. You guys must have just memorized that sermon. It's in your heart. I, I love it. I love it. Well, did you see that? 12, 13, 17, love one another. I've given these commandments that you would love one another. Why does he say that? Because God wants us to become people of love. We're talking about becoming people of prayer. Notice how 16 and 17, this ends with prayer. Here's what I want us to focus on today. Three times in this section, Jesus uses the word friends. You see that? 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his what? Friends. You are my what? 
friends if you do what I command. This, uh, verse 15, I love 15. 15 is where we're going to land for most of the morning. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. Do you see Jesus as the distant deity? Do you see Jesus as the, the angry boss, the upset father? Do you see Jesus as, uh, as your assistant? Do you see Jesus as your genie? Or do you see Jesus as a friend? Do you know how Jesus sees you? Do you know how Jesus sees us as his people? When Jesus is looking down at our church right now, this room, when Jesus sees us right now, Jesus looks at us and says, those people are my friends. Did you know that if you're a Muslim? If you are a Muslim, Allah is so holy and other, you can't know him in a personal way. You can't. You can't know him in a personal way. There, so, so what that means is this. There is nothing for Islam, there's nothing in Islam that says you can know God as a friend. If you're a Buddhist, well, if you're a Buddhist, honestly, Buddhism doesn't even believe that there's a supreme being. Buddhism doesn't even believe that there's a supreme God. Buddhism is really more of a quest for enlightenment and peace. So what that means is this. There is nowhere on the table in Buddhism where you can know God as a friend. Christianity is the only faith in the world that says God looks at his people and says, all of those people are my friends. Christianity is the only faith in the world that says you can know God. You can have a personal relationship with God. What's that mean? It means you can be friends with him. Hello? Hello? Right? Maybe you have mastered this, and I love it, but this is, a, this is so revolutionary for me. That you can be friends with Jesus. And listen, being friends with God, being friends with Jesus, talking, about, talking the way that we're, that we're uh, t- talking about this morning, that, that the view of Jesus that he wants us to have of him is that Jesus is our friend. That doesn't diminish the holiness of God. That doesn't mean there's no reverence when it comes to Jesus at all. Listen, and the reason it doesn't diminish the holiness of God is because your friendship with Jesus is different than your friendship, say, with people at work. Different than, say, your friendship with people at school, at church. And here's why. It's not because your friendship with Jesus is not as real as your other friends. It's because your friendship with Jesus is deeper than any other relationship you could ever have. Right? It it is deeper than any other relationship you could ever have. You say, what do I mean? Here's what I mean. Jesus as our friend, if you're taking notes, write these down. Jesus as our friend, some it means he knows us. Jesus as our friend means he knows us. I mean, listen, you think about your friends. I don't know who your friends are, your best friends or whatever. You think about your friends. You can be yourself around your friends. Hello? Hello? Right, you can let your hair down, you can just be you, you don't have to fake it, you don't have to be somebody you're not, or pretend. I talk to people all the time who tell me, Mark, there are things about me not even the closest people in my life know. Mark, I've never told my spouse this. Mark, I've never told my best friends this. Mark, there are things about me that if everybody knew, I just don't know what they would think about me. Look at me. Jesus knows everything there is to know about you, and he looks at you and says, that person is my friend. Jesus knows everything you got hidden in your closet and says, you're my friend. Jesus as my friend means that he's with us. That's the second thing. Jesus as our friend means he is with us. Well, what that means is, listen, I can't think of honestly a a more hurtful thing, something that's just harder to go through than when a friend, than when someone you're convinced is going to be with you forever, all of a sudden just drops you. All of a sudden that relationship just ends. Man, it hurts. And the last promise that Jesus gives us was what? I am with you always. Hello. I am with you always. 
So you're sitting there thinking, listen, Mark, I feel all alone. Jesus is your friend. Mark, I don't have any friends. Jesus is. Last thing it means is that Jesus, when we say Jesus is our friend, Jesus as our friend also means that he laid down his life for us. Look at verse 13 again. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone, watch, lay down his life for his friends. So the greatest act of love that anybody could ever do for someone else, the greatest act of love is when someone sacrifices themselves for other people, and Jesus has done that for us. Why did he do that? Listen to me. Because we're his friends, church. He laid down his life for us because we are his friends. Friends, listen, Jesus is not a distant deity. He's not the angry boss or your disappointed father. Jesus loves you and laid down his life for you, and he is with you. Jesus is not, and Jesus is not the assistant or the genie, because listen to me, Jesus doesn't simply want to give you stuff. Jesus wants to give you himself. I have a box at home with every letter Elena has ever written to me. I know, I know, it's hard being this romantic, guys, but I handle it. It's just the burden, it's just the yoke that Jesus put on me. We talked about it last, I know, guys, I know, I know, I'm real sweet. Um, I really do, though, I have a letter, I have a box, every letter she's ever written me is in that box. You know what would be horrible? You know what would be the saddest thing ever? The saddest thing, would, the saddest thing, the saddest thing would be if I'm at home all day long, that box is open, and I'm reading Elena's letters, and I'm just reading them, and I'm reminiscing, and it reminds me of times when she wrote that, and, and I'm just excited about the letter, and I'm reading Elena's letters, and the entire time she is next to me. See, those letters are not ends in themselves. They are supposed to point me to a person. And too many times, listen, I'm a preacher. I love the Bible. I love the Word of God. Too many people find comfort in the book, and the book never drives you to the person that wrote it. I am looking for a verse that makes me feel better. Jesus is who you're looking for. And Jesus did not give you this so that you would end here. The letters, watch this, watch. The letters are supposed to drive you to a person who wants to be your friend. Some of you know this sermon intellectually. It has never scratched your heart. Oh, I know that Jesus is my friend. Why do you feel like he's out there? Why do you feel like he's disappointed with you? Why do you feel like he's your assistant? Why do you feel or treat him like a vending machine when the man wants to be your friend? And everything we do is meant to point you and drive you into a deeper relationship with that person. Church isn't an end in itself. It's meant, you to bring you in, it's meant to bring you into the presence of a person. Scripture's meant to bring you into the presence of a person. Everything we do for Jesus is meant to drive us into a deeper reality and experience of our friend, Jesus. So Mark, how can I get to know Jesus as a friend? Answer, prayer. There's the answer. The way that you can know Jesus as a friend is prayer. Why? Because every relationship thrives on communication. Hello? Every relationship thrives on communication. Your relationship with Jesus won't be any different. But listen, 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 look at me. I need you to hear this. This will take work, man. This is hard. Every single thing that matters in your life came into you, and you're sustaining it with work and sweat and discipline. Hello? Right? If you got a relationship that matters in your life, you're working to maintain that relationship. You got something special in your life, you're working to maintain whatever it is. Everything that's significant to you, you're holding on to it with work and sweat and discipline. Same thing will be true in your relationship with Jesus. Look at me. If you're taking notes, write this down. Your relationship with Jesus, you will get out of it what you put into it. Hello? You just will. You will get out of it what you put into it. 
You can't expect to not put anything into your relationship with Jesus, walk into this experience, and get some Jesus dust sprinkled on you. It just magically falls from heaven like we got a bag of it we bought at Walmart, and we, we put it in the air vents, and that just sprinkles on people, and you leave loving God more. No, you got to cultivate that in your life. You get out of your relationship with Jesus what you put into it. What that means is this. It's going to take some discipline to become a church of prayer. Amen? It's going to take some discipline. Now listen, not discipline to earn the grace of God, but discipline in response to the grace that we've received. Hello? Not discipline to try to earn it, but man, he's given us such grace. The response is Jesus. We said we sang it earlier. I surrender to you. I want to obey you. Man, obedience takes work. Discipline. I love this quote from Henry Nowen, my guy that I quote here every single week. They're going to start charging me for when I quote this guy. Here it is again, though. A spiritual life without discipline. What Would you watch this, man? This is gold. A spiritual life without discipline is impossible. Discipline is the other side of discipleship. The practice of a spiritual discipline makes us more sensitive to the small, gentle voice of God. Just makes us more sensitive to the small, gentle voice of God. Of God. Every single thing in our lives that matters requires work. And listen, one of the reasons this is hard is because everything in the world is designed to get you to not pray. You've got to hear this, man. Everything in the world is designed to get you to not pray. The world, the flesh, and the devil are not going to set back while we want to become a church of prayer. They're not going to, the devil is not going to be off in the corner say, say, saying, oh wow, Summit is going to become a people of prayer. How cute. That's not going to be what Satan does. He's a liar and a thief and a murderer. Watch this, mark it down. Here's just a prophetic word. As we try to become a church of prayer, a praying people, this will get harder, not easier. Mark it down. This will get harder, church will get harder. Satanic attacks will come in individuals' lives, families, relationships. This will get harder, not easier. Why? The language is true. When we want to follow Jesus and get serious about becoming a people of prayer, hell breaks loose. Amen? And says, not on my watch. This will get harder. But look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Prayer is how the kingdom is going to come into the world. So it is worth it. So what if, here we are, end of the, here we are just kicking off this year, we're wrapping up our first series of the year. What if this year you graduate school, you get that job, you get that promotion, you move into that house, you knock things off your bucket list, but you never experience Jesus as a friend this year? Will it be worth it? Hey, what if this year you stream everything there is to stream on Netflix, man? You're caught up. Woo! Right? Everybody asks you what that show's like, and man, you know, you've streamed it all. What if this year you make that team? You make those grades? What if this year you do that thing that you've always wanted to do, and the whole year God wanted to tell you something, and you just never, you just never heard him? What if this year you spend a lot of energy and time wondering what people at work or school think about you, wondering what people online you don't even know think about you, when the entire time you are known and loved by Jesus, but you missed it? Will it be worth it? Look at me and we're done. What's on the table from God for 2020, for every single one of us, is simply to know Jesus as a friend. And the deeper I go into that reality, the fruit that comes is a person of prayer because I want to be with my friends. And so maybe for you that means coming to Jesus for the very first time. Or maybe for you it means coming back to Jesus. Maybe for you you're thinking about your relationship with God and you're thinking, listen, Mark, I'm not perfect, but this sounds like my relationship with Jesus. I know what this is like to know Jesus as a friend. Well, then genuinely praise God, thank Him and worship Him this morning. But if not... And man, the Spirit of God's just speaking to you. Say, Mark, I want this for me. I want this for me. I want to know Jesus this way in 2020. Well, don't resist. Don't make excuses like we sang earlier. Surrender to the Spirit.
Because the way that we become people of prayer is to know Jesus as a friend. Would you pray with me this morning? Just pray with me. And, and as, we're, as we're just moving into a time of prayer, maybe you're here and you're thinking, Mark, listen, when you were talking about all those different ways to know God earlier, I felt like you were talking to me. I, I really felt like you were describing what my relationship with God looks like. Mark, if I'm honest, I feel like God's that distant deity. And, and listen, I, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I just I feel like he's out there more than with me. Mark, listen, I, I'm saved, but I just have a hard time believing that God likes me. I, I know that God loves me, but, but I feel like God might be more like my earthly father or my boss or people in authority who've been in my life, and, and they didn't really like me. And my fear is that God is the same way. Or Mark, as you were describing that, I just feel like my relationship with God, I didn't even intend for this to happen. I just feel like my relationship with God has become really just where he's an assistant that I go to when I need help. But when things are quote unquote good, I, I don't really talk to him. Or Mark, I just treat God like a genie. He's just a vending machine. Or you're here and you're just saying, Mark, I have a hard time experiencing Jesus as a friend. If that's you, just put your hand up right now, just in a moment of honesty. I just have a hard time with that. Put your hand up. There's a hand right there. There's another one. Anyone else? There's two hands. Anyone? Just put them up real high as a moment of honesty. God, I just have a hard time experiencing you as a friend. Anyone else? There's another one right there. Anybody else? Listen, if you just raised your hand, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but deep down this is for you, the Spirit of God is speaking to you, I just want our church to hear this and receive it this morning that Jesus Christ has removed every barrier in the way that would prevent you from being his friend. Every barrier is gone. Your sin's been paid for. Your debt's been paid. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And listen, if that is you, you are his friend. And he's yours. Greater love has no, has no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends, and Jesus did that for you because you're his friend. And so Jesus, right now, uh, right now, that's our prayer, that, that as we just move into this year, and God, hopefully this year we accomplish a lot of things. We knock things off our bucket list. We, we meet some goals that we've had. Maybe we get out of debt or, or just on and on. There's all kinds of different things that we want to do, and hopefully, God, some of those things are going to happen. They're going to become reality. But Jesus, if we do it all, and we just miss you as a friend, I don't know if it'll be worth it. So Jesus, would you just create in this church surrender and humility and hearts where the deepest cry is to know Jesus as a friend. You might be here right now just in this, in this moment of prayer. You might be here and you're thinking this, Mark, listen, I'm going to need some of that discipline you were talking about. I feel like my relationship with God is just really carefree and, and you know, it, it, it has starts and stops to it. And, and there's church services where I get really emotional and this is going to be the thing that changes. And when that emotion fades, so does my relationship. Mark, I need the Holy Spirit to give me discipline. Listen, Summit, did you know that self-control is a fruit of the Spirit? And self-control might feel like just a lot of times just trying to go to church, just, just trying to pray. But listen, those desires that you got in your heart for God, that's God at work in your life. But if you're here and you're thinking, Mark, I want to know Jesus as a friend, I'm going to need some of that discipline you were talking about. If that's you, just put your hand up in the air right now so I can pray for you. Just put your hand up right now. Anybody in the room? I, I want some of that discipline and self-control so I can seek him. There's two hands. Anybody else? There's another one. There's another one right there. I, I'm just going to need some of that discipline. There we go right there. There's another one. Anybody else? I'm just going to need some of that discipline moving forward into 2020 if I'm really going to become a person of prayer. Father, you just see all these hands and you see all these hearts. And so, God, whatever that's going to look like, God, give it to us. 
God, I pray that you would help us to deal with habits that we've formed. I pray that you would help us to, to deal with strongholds and mindsets that have literally been built in our minds that prevent us getting in the way of, of being people of prayer. Father, I pray that you'd protect us from the schemes and the, and, the, and the strategies of the enemy. God doesn't want us to do this. And God, give us self-control. Holy Spirit, self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Give it to us. Give us that kind of discipline. But listen, you, you might be here today and you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never surrendered to Him. You believe in Him intellectually. Everybody in your family has a relationship with Jesus. You know the Bible. You like church. But you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus because that is what He wants with you. you. Say, Mark, what do I have to do? Well, the gospel is that Jesus has paid the price for us so that we come to Him with repentance and faith, turning from our sin, turning from trying to live life on our own without Him, and putting our trust in Him making Him our Lord and our Savior. And so today, if you want to do that, if you want to give your life to Jesus like that, then I want to lead you in a prayer. And right now, you just pray this prayer with me this morning. Dear, dear Jesus, forgive me for my sin and save me. I am sorry for building a life without you. I surrender it to you right now. Be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for loving me and dying for me and coming back from the dead for me. Help me to start living for you right now. And God, for the rest of us this morning, God, for our entire church, Father, I pray that you would build this culture in us where we would become a church of prayer, a people of prayer, that prayer isn't simply one thing we do among others. It is the thing that we do. It is the way that we go into the world. It, it, is, it is the first step that we take. It, it's just a part of our DNA. God, get us there. Make it into the culture of our church. Make it the air that we breathe as a church, that we are a people who when we pray, like right now, we know that the God of the universe is listening. We know that the God of the universe moves in prayer. And it's not because of us. It's because Jesus and his finished work, he's at your right hand. And you have put your Holy Spirit inside of us. And even right now in this time of prayer, the Spirit is praying with groanings too deep for words that we understand. God, you are listening and you're moving. The kingdom is coming right now. And so God, make us a people of prayer. Not just for this year. Not just for this moment. God, we are praying for revival and renewal. And give us the discipline. Give us the endurance to pray and to seek it until it comes. And even if we don't see it, even if we die and walk into your presence and we're praying prayers that you're not going to answer until the next generation or generations after that, Father, it will have been worth it. Because in the seeking and in the praying, we are coming to you and you're our friend. So make us people of love. Make us a people who are a blessing to the world. And make us a people of prayer. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, and amen, and amen. Listen, guys. Yeah, so, so what we talked about this morning, this is going to be just a rhythm this year. We are going to stay on this all year long uh, just to be focused on what would it look like for Summit to be a people of prayer. And so pray EKY. Listen, our prayer, my prayer for this is not that it would be a series that we do, that it would be a literal movement of prayer that would sweep over eastern Kentucky in every single county. Uh, and so, so why not here? Why not right now in and through our church? And so I want to invite you to, one, be a part of it, to, one, uh, also begin to pray uh, that God would move in our church, move in your life, Three, I want to invite you to be a, in a small group. Small groups start 
in February. I would love for you to sign up. You can do it right now. You can stop listening to me if you've got the Summit app. You can click sign up in the app, and you can sign up for small groups right now.